asking notes. Please be sure to take a few moments to complete the poll questions that you see on the right side of your screen. It'll help us to tailor content for future Hawaiian Telecom Universities. We'll also be sharing this later on during the meeting. So please uh, take your time and go ahead and complete those two quick questions. Um, I'd also like to point out that at any point during this time, there is a Q&A panel. Please send your questions to all panelists. We'll be reviewing that at the end of the presentation. I'd like to introduce our Vice President of Sales for Hawaiian Telecom, Jason Fujita. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, aloha and welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today at our second virtual Hawaiian Telecom University event. Uh, these events are really designed to help you, our customers and community, learn more about technology and how the right technology can help you achieve your goals. Our theme today, enabling success through technology in the post-COVID-19 environment, is something that we believe is top of mind for most local businesses right now. We're pleased to co-host this event with our sister company, CBTS. CBTS, which stands for Connect, Build, Transform, and support is a leading technology provider that delivers communications, cloud, infrastructure, and consulting solutions to clients across North America. CBTS launched their Hawaii location here at Hawaiian Telecom in January. And what's really exciting is if when, when you combine their vast technology experience with our local uh, sales, engineering, and architecture teams, the possibilities and the solutions are incredibly powerful for the Hawaii business community, things that we've never seen before. We have already collaborated on a number of transformative projects and look forward to working together to help more local businesses implement innovative technologies that drive desired outcomes. One of the many benefits that CBTS brings to Hawaii is their strategic partnerships with industry leaders. Aligned with this, we're pleased to present today's event with Hewlett Packard Enterprise. HPE is a global edge to cloud platform as a service company that's helping businesses to connect, protect, and analyze data and applications. When this pandemic started to heat up here in March, many businesses quickly transformed to a work from home model that challenged network access, capacity, and security. While this quick transition was necessary, Many businesses have discovered efficiencies and benefits in this new way of working and plan to continue operating in a full or hybrid remote work environment. Here at Hawaiian Telecom, about 60% of our workforce has been working from home since mid-March. And as a result of this flexible work from home model, we've seen some positive results. For example, productivity and efficiency has improved during this time as factors like traffic and office distractions have been eliminated. In addition, we saw our customer satisfaction scores improve over the past few months. While we're starting to reintegrate employees safely back into the office in phases, many will continue to work from home at least through the end of the year. During today's event, we'll be examining this trend and learning best practices for data backup and business continuity solutions that will help your business fine tune its remote workforce model in order to thrive in 2020 and beyond. I'd like to introduce you to our two speakers today. First, we have Michael Reed, Storage Solutions Architect. Mike is a longtime technologist, having specialized in network engineering, and more recently, all things storage. He resides in Milanani with his wife and two daughters. They fear when life gets back to normal, their son will pack his things in the mainland and move back home, asking for his old room again. Yeah, it's okay, Mike, it won't be that bad. Um, and we have Brian Carlton, Director of West and Central Storage Solutions Architects. Brian leads the West and Central US Storage Architect team and is passionate about technology. He resides in Northern California with his wife and two kids, but misses his trips to Hawaii to see customers. And we miss you too, Brian. Uh, before I turn this over to Michael and Brian, um, you know, I just want, want to remind everyone that, you know, Hawaiian Telecom is really here to support you. Um, we definitely understand in this environment, um, there's a lot of questions, um, a lot of unknown, and we certainly want to be a part of potentially helping your business get through this, this incredibly unique uh, time in our, our lives. So uh, with that, if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to your account manager or our call center. 
and we'll be happy to help you. We're committed to Hawaii. We're here for you. Thank you for again for joining us and have a great session. Thank you, Jason. Uh, is my screen coming through? All right, perfect. So, so let's get started. So how did we get here? Um, if you're listening today and you're kind of like Lucy and you woke up this morning with zero clue or remembrance as to what happened yesterday, uh, we're in the midst of a global coronavirus flu pandemic that has interrupted our social and economic lives collectively. You know, I think that's no shocker there, but uh, you know, we've had other pandemics in our lifetime. In 2009, we had about 12,000 deaths in the US. Uh, late 60s, about 100,000 deaths in the US. The late 50s, we saw, I think, a little bit more than 100,000 deaths. And if there's anybody on the phone today that uh, was around back in the early 1900s, it was almost 700,000 deaths in the US from an estimated 50 million people worldwide. Um, you know, pandemics aside, uh, health is a concern for families and being able to move on. But, uh, you know, I think we're here today really to talk about technology and business and, and you know, how this is driving or impacting our, you know, economies in that, in that sense. Across the US, our federal government has made recommendations and provisions to assist the states in their readiness to fight the pandemic. Now, what's been good for us is our distance from the mainland or other land masses has been the key ally in our combat against the virus. So again, just basically based on the, uh, the virus itself, thankfully, our infection and death rates has been lowest in the nation with some of the strictest measures taken. You know, we've had uh, directions come out from our governor uh, leading with stay at home orders, closures for non-essential government offices, businesses, mandatory 14 day quarantine for visitors and returning residents to the state. There's been many supplemental proclamation or extensions to this order. Following suit, each county had their also the corresponding orders and proclamations. Um, our distance and actions have served us well, but it's come at a cost. We're lowest in infection rates, but we're highest in economic impact. And I, and I think you know, everyone here understands that. Uh, due to unemployment, our industries majorly have been impacted. Revenues are near nothing in transportation, hospitality, healthcare, retail, uh, small to medium businesses. All of this leads to lowering excise taxes, so less what the government can do for us. You know, we've been here before. I call these 9-11 moments. These are, you know, part of my talking points whenever I talk about disaster recovery and business. Uh, but if you had an office in one of those towers, your desk, your files, your computers, your post-it notes, anything and everything you were working on, your data is all gone. Uh, if your uh, backups were, you know, like a lot of people I hear when I, when I talk about backup strategies, they're like, yeah, we, uh, we kind of drop things off to USBs or we drop things off to disks. Um, we take them home on the weekend, stuff like that. All that was gone uh, in, the, in that 9-11 moment. Your workspace for employees are gone. Your workspace where you met with customers are gone. So there was a, a new normal during that time period that, that uh, took some time to get some adjustment. Not only was it a physical tragedy, but I mean, I think it was a heart check tragedy for many Americans across the country. Back in 2004, the Indian Ocean earthquakes and tsunamis also had huge net effects, loss of life, destruction, property, loss of data that stretched across 14 different countries. And back home, we had our own 9-11 moment, Hurricane Iniki, which hit 9-11 in 92, destroyed thousands of homes, some hotels, utilities, infrastructure, agriculture, major impacts to tourism for some time to come. And even on a, a lesser known scale, or uh, you know, a smaller scale, back in 2006, how many remember the Kiholo Bay earthquake? It caused less damage, primarily, you know, that kind of hit on the Big Island, but we had power disruptions statewide. And anytime you have no power, you're not able to utilize your technology. Disasters, large and small, have differing levels of impact to our business and economics. Data loss costs time and money. Our businesses are all unique and have different exposure levels that must be considered. And consequently, we have different budgets and priorities and risks to ensure business continuity.
So disasters happen. What now? How are you continuing business back to previous levels and beyond? Is your workforce coming back? Will you remain fragmented, distant from employees and customers? Has your capital been affected? Has previous projects been put on delay for new tactical projects taken spotlight? The federal government has responded. Uh, you know, they came out with a, uh, a stimulus package that's dwarfed all previous hard time era stimulus packages, and they're looking at other stuff. The CARES Act, um, it's given us uh, paycheck protection for small business. It's, it's uh, given us protection in larger industries in general. It's given money to the states to be utilized in different, uh, different ways. So from a perspective of, you know, industry and your business and everything else, there is help, there is assistance out there to keep things going. Corporate America also responded. Uh, I recall seeing a lot of different things, you know, from, you know, the Cisco's of the world, um, you know, Dell EMC's, the, the larger corporations, they've been out there. Well, HP was also out there. And, you know, we, we immediately started a campaign here to help. Uh, we immediately reached out to tens of thousands of businesses by phone to see how we could help. Everybody from the CEO on down to the lowest person was on the phone, just calling customers, you know, showing empathy um, and just literally wanting to know what was affected by your business. How can we help? We created giving campaigns, corporate matching donations. Uh, we supported important work at some of the world's leading research centers by offering up our our leadership in high performance computing, artificial intelligence. We donated equipment uh, across the nation and internationally, helping stand up many pop up healthcare facilities. We provided expertise, we provided equipment, and we provided dollars. We designated more than $2 billion for financing to help businesses continue despite their financial challenges due to COVID 19. So the new normal, I mean, I think this is something I hear every day. I hear it on the news, I hear it in social media, I hear it just in casual conversation. What does the new normal really look like, especially for you, especially in your business? Um, has your workforce returned? That Those poll questions, they're, they're serious questions. How, you know, what are you facing? Um, is your customers returned? Will work from home be your new normal for the short or long term? If you had challenges around simple things like BYOD, bring your own devices, or onboarding those devices for access to your corporate applications and data. Uh, a lot of people that I talked to had methods of working from home. They had methods of getting into their corporate data centers. They had VPN access. They had things like that. They just didn't have the scale. They weren't ready for the scale and they weren't ready for the entire workforce to, to, to go um, remote. What we're seeing is the return to home is not a priority across our customer base. Uh, and that's here in Hawaii, that's uh, nationally. Uh, in our workplace, HP is not forcing any employees to come back in until they feel ready or feel safe. And I think that's probably a common sentiment is that safe feeling, right? Just like 9-11, it was a heart check, you know, uh, what people were going through. Uh, the pandemic is real. You talk to some people and some people kind of scoff at it and other people, it's a real issue. So. Um, you know, you might be dealing with that in your workplace. Tactically, our customers are fixing their work from home shortfalls with better VDI infrastructure, virtual desktop infrastructure, and remote connectivity solutions. Some of them are behind the game, but others are, you know, um, they're, they're ramping up. Gartner published a strategic roadmap for storage uh, this past week. And uh, in it, they pointed out that post COVID organizations are focusing on continuous cost, cost optimization. So they, they say that I know leaders are reinvesting those savings in digital business initiatives. Um, I, I don't think it's any uh, surprise. Everyone kind of had a digital transformation agenda somewhere in their business, moving things, moving their business outcomes to digital business initiatives. And, and now post COVID, that is, uh, that's uh, kind of a fast track for most INO leaders. Widespread use of artificial intelligence operations or what we call AI ops will transform IT infrastructure management into a more proactive, predictive environment, reducing administration and downtime costs. These are key areas that they're looking at. Gartner also noted leaders are reassessing on-prem backup solutions for hybrid cloud storage services. In each one of the disasters I showed you, on-prem sometimes is no longer there. 
Um, I've talked to customers locally here, they could not get in their data center with the stay at home order, with their businesses, uh, things like that. If they had an RMA, uh, they were challenged just to get in and change out those hard drives or change out their failed controllers or whatever they were working on. Um, so, you know, that was a reality. Um, so reassessing your on-prem backup solutions for hybrid cloud storage services is, is a priority according to Gartner. Uh, those areas address three major functions. They address disaster recovery, they address cybersecurity, which there was an uptick, uh, and they address non-disruptive testing and development work. So it gives you an, an environment where you can test, develop, and uh, develop your applications to be more cloud friendly, uh, to be able to have business continuity and solution in, in issues like this. So solutions for VDI, they really need to fit the needs of the organization. And what I mean by that is uh, we do provide t-shirt size solutions for quick procurement and delivery, but we also tailor fit the most demanding and critical VDI initiatives across the hypervisor, compute, and storage platforms. So whether that would be on hyper-converged, converged, software-defined infrastructures, uh, tailor fit VDI is gonna be critical and necessary, but it can be quick and efficient. Uh, we also have as a service options that we'll talk about later. Work from home setups, uh, business pop-ups. If you recall, during this pandemic, uh, there was uh, ships that were outfitted uh, for uh, Mercy ships, you know, having beds for hospitals. There was hospitals, beds that were set up in arenas. There was hospital setups that were uh, set up in parking lots uh, across the globe. And all of these require technology, um, and they all present unique challenges when it comes to remote connectivity. So much like your staff may be working from home, uh, much like you trying to, uh, you know, transition this, uh, can't be in the office, can't meet with the customers, how do I do that? Um, there's there's uh, unique challenges uh, in remote connectivity all centered around that. Um, how many has been on Zoom calls where it seems like one person on the other end is inside a forest with perpetual one bar cell service, cutting in, cutting out. Um, you know, everybody's work from home situation is unique. Some are in their kitchens, you know, some are in shared uh, bedrooms and, uh, you know, some are just sitting out on the porch. And so you've got birds and traffic and, and, and other things to deal with. Um, so, you know, these challenges are real and things that you need to think about, but many solutions exist and can quickly be accessed to solve these issues. Remember that Gartner assessment I was talking about concerning backup strategies for hybrid cloud storage. Well, we're seeing trends and we've always seen these trends, but we're seeing a lot more trends in hybrid on-prem and cloud, not only for backup, but for business continuity as a whole across all workloads. Cloud from Hawaii for primary workloads is challenging. In fact, it's challenging worldwide. Um, Amazon uh, created Outpost, Azure created Stack, Google created Anthos, VMware's Cloud Foundation all address these. They all are hybrid solutions bringing the cloud closer to you. So, you know, if, if, you, if you look at that, our multi-cloud strategy is the best of all worlds because we don't make you choose any one single option, rather the infrastructure remains open to use some, none, or all of those options. We provide you with the best near zero RPO, RTO business continuity solutions at the scale and economy where you require. We don't replace public cloud, we enhance public cloud and we give you true options in that. Some other trends that customers continue to embrace are container software platforms. So with less, less reliance on any specific virtualization platform, right? Less tie into virtualization. Those challenges exist whenever you're trying to go from your virtualization platform or your physical platform and just move your apps to the cloud, you realize, well, cloud's not built that way. Container software uh, platforms give you that uh, uh, freedom uh, to be able to develop, test, deploy your applications uh, across public clouds, across private clouds, and it uh, gives you more agility and efficiency to overcome some of those limitations. So we're seeing a trend in uh, uh, really keying in on, on containers for developing your digital transformation. Also, as noted, disasters happen. Revisit your data protection capabilities. Follow best practice, like three copies of data, 
two different formats, one offsite copy. That's why that hybrid cloud strategy is important. Um, you don't have to be just you know an enterprise customer. You can accomplish these things as a small business or no matter what you're trying to accomplish, you can accomplish these things uh, within budgets and within economies. So um, you, know, you need to look at these type things uh, for business continuity. Um, but these are going to help in disasters uh, of today and future disasters. I find most customers think about data protection uh, primarily due to ransomware or cybersecurity or employee errors. Uh, but you can't discount the fact that man-made or natural disasters can cause massive disruption and uh, you need to be ready for those. And, and it's a lasting disruption. You know, we're not seeing this pandemic go away. We're seeing upticks, we're seeing swings. Uh, I was just listening to a, a podcast this morning that said Brazil is really on a tear. So Brazil numbers are are really going up. And, you know, we have here in Hawaii, we have an affinity with Brazilians. You know, uh, people like to come over, they like to surf, they like to, uh, they love the beach atmosphere. It's a, it's a similar culture. Um, I personally know a handful of Brazilians and, and they've been at my house uh, recently. So, um, you know, this is a global pandemic. Uh, it could last a while. Um, so these are things that you got to think about. Finally, don't let your budget limit your success. We're here to help. As Brian takes over uh, in his session, uh, he's going to help identify strategies that our customers have been using for over a decade, transitioning capital purchases into infrastructure or platform as a service models. Hey, thanks, Mike. Um, I think we'd like to review some of the poll questions and, um, you know, just kind of let you guys see that. I don't know if uh, you guys can see the results on, on the screen, but it's actually pretty interesting. Um, I'm actually a little bit surprised. There was actually 13% of the respondents uh, replied that 100% of their workforce is currently working from home. Um, that's actually really surprising. I think a lot of the customers that we're talking to uh, fall into a lot of the other categories, right? 20, uh, percent of you said 75% or more and, and another 31% at 50% at or so. And that's generally been the trend that we've seen with a lot of our customers from both the small to medium sized business up through the enterprises that, um, you know, roughly about 50% to 75% uh, of the workforce is, is remote. And uh, I'd be interested in finding out for those uh, that did respond uh, that 100% are working from home. Uh, how that's going for you, because I think a lot of the customers that are struggling today to, to kind of just operate in a 50% mode, uh, you know, there's another 10% or so at 25% at uh, working from home. And, and quite surprisingly is, is actually, um, you know, 7% of the respondents said that, that no one is working from home. Um, so I kind of want to see some of those outliers because we traditionally see it in that middle space, right, anywhere from the 25% up to the 50 to 75, but mainly in that middle space. Um, so that's kind of actually really interesting. Um, and then the second question that we had was, how will your business continue to operate over the next three to six months? And this is exactly in line with what every customer we've talked to over the last uh, couple of months has said to us, right? That nobody really knows what the next three to six months, you know, let alone a year or even farther out contain. And so, uh, you know, 83% of you said that, uh, you know, you're going to continue to work in this hybrid mode where, you know, you both uh, work from home as well as being in the office, um, you know, and then only 2% said that, hey, they're going to continue staying home forever. Um, and then, you know, a small percentage of 11% saying going back to the office, everyone headed back. So uh, not too different. I think, you know, Mike, I, I really liked a lot of the trends that you're sharing. Um, you know, really what I took away from that was that a lot of the high-level topics around, you know, data protection or, or you know, business continuity uh, didn't necessarily shift. They just accelerated it. I think you mentioned that. And so, um, you know, I want to introduce Brian, and, and Brian's going to touch on, as, as Mike mentioned, really how to take some of these trends and, and be ahead of the game and, and find some strategies to address that, make sure that you're approaching it in the right way so that you can be competitive in, in this new normal um, you know, and with that, you know, Brian, why don't you go ahead and, and take it away? Thanks, Marcus. You know, Mike painted a pretty um, descriptive picture of the trends that we've been seeing, how we've seen, as we talk to hundreds and hundreds of customers, how we've seen businesses adapting, how we've seen even families adapted. In fact, we were uh, talking before 
this session and we were talking about how it used to be that if you were working from home and you had kids and they walked into the room during a call or a webcast, you were shooing them out and you were apologizing, even if the dog barked. And now that's become just normal because in, in an instant, overnight almost, we've pivoted from how we've known business and how we've known the world to operate into this, what is becoming a new normal, it appears. And so um, this reality is certainly upon us. And, and Mike touched on trends like security and virtual desktop and um, other work from home strategies that have been a reality for a while. But all of a sudden, those came into focus over the past few months and became not just a strategy, but a necessity. And um, we saw customers immediately put everything on hold and begin making sure their uh, work from home, VPN, uh, all of those connectivity type of um, technologies were in place so their people could work from home if that wasn't already in place. So a lot of effort has happened and we've seen so much transformation already. But you may be, you may be listening to this and you may be saying, well, Mike, Brian, this is great. These are some great trends and these are great ideas. But my business has been, from a revenue perspective, potentially gutted or severely impacted by uh, customers disappearing for a period of time or at least dwindling. So my IT budget is not necessarily flush or my IT budget may have disappeared or shrunk. And so my new normal, just from a budget perspective may be changing and and how our IT staff work may be changing. So I want to talk about um, a, a strategy that has seen a huge uptick in our business, and that is this as a service model. About a decade ago, as a company, we started a down this as a service path, offering some um, some key products or some key solutions prepackaged. Uh, offering those as a service. You can consume it or buy it as you need it. And then last year at our uh, North American customer facing uh, com uh, conference, HPE Discover, which happens in Vegas, our CEO came out and said, uh, made a pretty bold statement that over the next few years, we wanted to become a company that could offer everything as a service. And we started creating this buzz term about everything as a service. Well, the reality of that um, is coming to pass. And, and today, just about everything that we do as a company, um, we can offer as a service. Um, next slide, please. So uh, that offering for us is called GreenLake. And I want to talk a little bit about this um, less and less about the technology side and more about a business conversation to frame, to frame some of these data points that Mike pre presented about how business is changing and what this new normal might become. So this as a service model is a model for infrastructure. And actually it can be almost any product, whether it's software or hardware or services that we offer that can be purchased and consumed in a pay per use model. It can scale up and down, and that's really important too. It's great that something can scale with you. If you ever heard the term elastic or elasticity, it's great that thing that that your infrastructure and IT can expand with you. But what about if you need it to scale down? What about if you need that bill to go down? And so this model is something that can scale up and it can scale down. It's something that we can manage for you, or you can be partially involved in. And there's a self-service aspect to the degree that if, uh, if you need more of a particular piece of the infrastructure or more of a particular piece of, uh, of a service, you can go into a portal and you can click, click, and we can deliver that. Most importantly, this kind of new way of, of consuming and, and running your infrastructure can exist on-prem in your own in your own building, in your own data center. It could live in a co-location facility like Hawaiian Telecoms or any other colo, or it could live in the cloud, the public cloud. 
And there may be benefits to both. There may be combo combinations uh, of those that make sense. Uh, next slide. You know, um, what we've seen as a trend is the vast majority of applications and data, uh, we're saying about 70% based on this particular study, 70% uh, of applications and data are mission critical to your business, mission critical to how your business functions, to how your business runs. But in spite of the fact that the majority of that data is mission critical, they're encompassed by uh, applications and frameworks that are fairly common. Um, database backends, web front ends, or, or even uh, a CRM. And contained within that is unique data to your business and how you offer that to your customers and to your employees and, and your team may be different. But the infrastructure to run that becomes a lot more ubiquitous. And nobody necessarily likes to hear that their environment or their business is just like somebody else's. But the reality is the applications and what's inside them is what's unique to your business. It's what makes your business desirable to customers, less so the infrastructure that it runs on. But the infrastructure is important because if it goes down or if it becomes unavailable, your business stops. So the idea behind our as a service model is that we recognize this data trend. And if we can take away the concern about the infrastructure and bring our knowledge and our expertise to that, you can then spend more time focusing on what's more important for your business. Next. So these pay per use workloads, what is, what is that? Well, Mike talked earlier about virtual desktop infrastructure. Huge trend. I would say five years ago, um, businesses started looking at this VDI thing. What is this? How could we use this in our business? Does this make sense? And two years ago, um, businesses were starting to implement this and saying, oh, yeah, we get this. This starts to make sense now. Well, fast forward to today and the majority of your workforce may be working from home and they may be working home from home for a period of time. And you may say, well, we have some security constraints. We have uh, data that really needs to be kept secure and it's dangerous for us to let it leave our facilities on laptops or be out in public or out in people's homes. VDI solves that problem. Regardless of what this workload is, whether it's a specific application, you have this new container uh, implementation you're looking at, you're thinking of doing some Kubernetes and some cloud native applications, or maybe you just have um, aging infrastructure that needs a refresh. Regardless of what the use case is, this pay per use workload model um, can fit and it can be customized to anything. Next. So, so what do we mean by pay per use? Well, the idea behind this as a service model is to give you some financial flexibility towards other projects and other operations, or maybe just um, the running of your business during this economic uncertainty. Um, but maybe more importantly, freeing up this capital to be creative in other areas as we embrace, again, this, this idea of the new normal. And, and the whole goal of this whole as a service model is to give our customers a cloud experience. Okay, so what is the cloud experience? Well, if you're, if you're a CIO and you're leading an IT team, you probably have asked the question of, well, how can we bring the cloud into our business or how can we take our business into the cloud? Whether it's in whole or in part, that's a question every business may be asking. And you may have a, a, a CRM that runs in the cloud. It may be hosted, it may not be, it may be something you maintain. But the benefit of the cloud experience is that it's there when you need it, it scales up and down, and you can add more when you need it. Um, but we can prevent some of the downsides of the cloud, like ingress and egress charges and um, potential downtime, lack of reliability that we've seen. And if you've seen any of the news, you've seen that some of the public cloud providers like AWS and Azure have had 
some issues with some downtime. But there's a reason that massive companies like Netflix used the public cloud, AWS, for years and years to run their business. And that was because it could scale up and down with them. If Netflix ran all of their own infrastructure, how would they estimate how much they needed based on who was streaming at any given time? The infrastructure they would need for Friday night when everybody was home for movie night would be so much different than Wednesday at noon when everybody was at work. So the cloud benefit is this, is this um, elasticity, the ability for the business, for the infrastructure to scale with you, whether it's up or down, but not have to pay for that entire load or house that entire load of infrastructure. So the cloud experience, that's, that's a really important one. Simplifying IT, um, another piece of the cloud experience is, is, is that it simplifies how IT shops do business. It centralizes your operations. It lets your IT team, it lets you focus on the projects that matter and not the infrastructure. And then, of course, the obvious benefit of it being managed for you, not having to worry about it. At a, at a very practical level, um, think, of, think of email. It wasn't that long ago that every business of some size managed an exchange environment of various degrees and architectures based on their needs. Microsoft Exchange for email. Today, that's almost entirely a hosted effort, whether it's in Office 365 or whether you still run it, but you have it hosted or you have a service that helps you with that. That's the idea we're talking about by taking some of those day-to-day uh, -day management functions from you so you can focus on new projects. Next. Okay, so here's a fancy term, consume outcomes, not infrastructure. The, the idea behind what we want to communicate here is over the last couple of decades, let's say, IT has existed to manage infrastructure and to help bring projects online and enable the business. That's a pretty traditional model. We figure out how we're going to buy it by budgeting, by making capital purchases and then depreciating assets. And we house that somewhere and we, we deal with all the expenses around that. The idea of our as a service model is to help you be able to pivot from this management of infrastructure to focusing on the stuff that matters to your business the most. And let's look at it this way. The infrastructure in your data center is not what matters most to your business. You can't run your business without it, but what matters to your business is your web front end, the, your store, the web store, uh, your CRM tool that houses all your customer data, the ability for your employees to work remotely and get into corporate assets. Those are the applications and tools that are most important to your business. So if you pivot your thinking to from managing infrastructure to how can we focus on those projects, this as a service model really comes out as being a benefit, lowering costs, simplifying what IT means for you, letting us help you manage it, uh, letting us manage firmware upgrades, letting us manage the bringing in of new gear and refreshing old gear, all of that, so that your focus can be in the business and then giving you control and security. And whether you're that shop that says, um, you know, Brian, I have to have my data on-prem where it's controlled, where it's safe, where it's secure. We have HIPAA compliance if we're a healthcare shop or we store credit card data. So we have PCI compliance, it doesn't matter. Um, it can live, this as a service model can live on-prem in the cloud, combination of both. It gives you flexibility. Next. So if we can shorten your time to deploy projects, right? Your CIO comes to you and says, hey, got this project. Bring me a plan on how we get this project off the ground. What infrastructure do you need? How many people do you need? What is this going to look like? If we can shorten that time so projects get off the ground and those, are, those become usable applications sooner, if we can help lower your risk by reducing unplanned downtime, if we can lower your CapEx uh, or increase your CapEx savings um, because you're not over-provisioning, 
those become compelling uh, arguments towards this as a service model. And think about this. If you're, if you're working on a new project and uh, you're looking at how much compute and RAM and storage and network infrastructure and in rack space and all this you're gonna need just so you can then begin thinking about how you get this new CRM or this new web front end, how you get this off the ground, you're looking at, okay, let's look at buying all that gear and taking an estimate for the next one, two, three, five years of depreciation of how we're gonna size that. And it's possible you're gonna end up buying the V8 as opposed to the V6. And it's possible you buy the V6 and realize you needed the V8 if I was using car analogies. So the ability for your infrastructure to grow and shrink with you as you need it by providing, providing some safety buffer so that we can grow with you, um, you eliminate that risk and you eliminate that uh, overspending. Next. So if any of these um, quotes, which may come from various levels of your business, ring true with you, um, there's an opportunity for you to look at this as a service model for how you approach infrastructure. And, and this doesn't have to be you being a Fortune 500 company. This can be any size company that needs some level of infrastructure. And it may be infrastructure that you that is not even HPE stuff. We can work with this model with um, infrastructure from other companies. More importantly, if any of these ring true with you, and if we can help you focus on the things that matter and less so on the infrastructure that um, is required, but is going, to is going to take effort and time away from the projects that matter the most, this could be compelling. Uh, next. So, um, so, so Mike talked about what we've seen as a trend in the industry. And the whole goal of us, of this talk was to talk about what trends and strategies we can bring and what we're seeing in this post COVID-19 time. I'll say this, I don't know what the future looks like for our country, for, for your state. I don't know what uh, technology needs will change, but I'll tell you that the new normal will be somewhat different and and we're seeing that now it's going to be different than we've known it in the past and we may not see it change and we may not see that new normal change for a while mike told you that our company is is not mandating anybody coming back to an office well that now means we're reevaluating our entire real estate strategy how much office space do we need companies like facebook and google are saying they don't plan to bring people back for a long time so this new model may become real. So the question is, how can you pivot and adapt to that rapidly? Because you will have to make some rapid change. And how can you do that in a way that enables your business to continue to flourish? So I hope this gives some, um, some ideas and gives you some things to think about. And this is a very, very high level uh, conversation that we can go far deeper into, um, but hopefully it provides a little bit of clarity. Um, that's what I've got. Marcus, I guess I'll hand it back to you. Hey, thanks, Brian. I think, uh, you know, of, of note is, is really around um, the presentation today was an adaptation of the hybrid cloud strategy of how, you know, digital transformation is really pushing that. Um, one of the questions that, that came in uh, regarding that was really around um, that hybrid cloud strategy for, for data protection, right? And really, um, do customers require HP software and equipment in, in their environment to achieve any of these things? I don't know if it would be you, Brian, or maybe Mike that could maybe answer that. Um, I think, you know, obviously we focused and highlighted a lot of HPE um, approaches and what HPE is doing to help customers do that. But is this really just specific to HPE or, you know, can they be utilized in conjunction with other uh, vendors, products, and, and services? Yeah, Marcus, I think I can take that. Um, I mean, it's a good question. Uh, and, and that's one of the things about cloud, right, is just not being locked in, uh, being able to have some flexibility. And uh, you would 
need to look at your strategy to, to make sure that you have that flexibility. Um, and a hybrid cloud strategy, if you think about it, kind of lends to uh, two principles. The hybrid part portion, which is you've got some assets on site, on prem, whether it's in your data centers, in a colo, or or you know something that that you have access to. Um, you know, maybe it's uh, physical servers, maybe it's virtual servers, um, and then there's the cloud portion, right? Being able to have some physical copies and and access to that locally, but then being able to also have uh, cloud access. Um, and HP as a as a cloud volume service, and and so we call it a service because there's different functions inside that uh, cloud volumes. You can you can have replication from on-site um, arrays, for example. And in that case, since we're taking direct replications, um, it would be HP equipment. Um, but we also have a function called backup. And that backup is uh, fronted with our Catalyst protocol. Uh, that does several things. ISVs or independent software vendors like Veeam and Commvault, uh, Veritas, Microfocus, uh, whoever supports the Catalyst protocol, they are able to take whatever they protect from their source. So if they're protecting, you know, our co competition today, they're protecting other servers, they're protecting, you know, some sort of virtual or physical workloads uh, or even cloud instances, they can protect that under their model, under their software and directly put that onto our target, which would be a cloud service uh, backup. Um, that does several things for you. It gives you that multiple copies. It gives you that one off site. Uh, it gives you a uh, an API based interface, which is um, pretty much immutable to ransomware. Um, and then from that, they can restore back on site and whenever there's problems or they can restore into our cloud service block, which gives them access to any of the public providers. Um, for compute, so they could they could tie an Azure or an Amazon VM onto that data, and they can use it for uh, continuous business, continuous operations. So if everything was to wipe away locally, um, it would be protected in the cloud. So, so no, they would not need to have any HP on site at all, and they could still have a cloud strategy that protects their data uh, through HP. Got it. Thanks, Mike. That's that's good to know that you guys are a little bit agnostic in that sense, right? I think there's always that fear of being locked in with that. Um, on that note, you know, you mentioned HPE GreenLake. Um, you know, is that something that the if anybody was interested in that and learning more about that, is that going? You know, do they reach out directly to HPE or how does that work, right? Can if I want to buy or consume AWS or Azure, I just go to their website and and do that? Is that something? That you guys can touch on of how GreenLake, how, how would someone find out more about that? Is that you know direct through HP or can I work with a, a, a local partner of my choice? I'm not sure if Brian's frozen, but I'll take that just in case. <laughs> but uh, um, so they can go right through uh, Hawaiian Telecom. Uh, the beauty of uh, having valued partners like Hawaiian Telecom is that any and all service products, softwares, uh, anything that they, they need from HP, they can go right to the partner Hawaiian Telecom. Um, they also have access to point and click portals, you know, when the service is running to, to be able to, to continue the model, but there's value of going through your local partner like Hawaiian Telecom. Yeah, I, I, I would concur with that. And I would say um, absolutely somebody, somebody like Hawaiian Telecom is adds so much value to the conversation. And what they will do in turn when you reach out to them is they'll pull us in for those more in-depth conversations so we can customize those to what your environment looks like. Um, but absolutely, that's something that can be done easily. We can have those conversations. Great, thank you guys. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else has any questions. I don't see anything else coming in, um, you know, but if you do have anything and you just, you know, it pops into your mind or, or whatnot afterwards, uh, please feel free to email us uh, questions, right? And obviously we can get together with Mike and Brian to kind of uh, tackle those specific maybe to your, your you know, situation.
situation or enterprise. Um, you know, it looks like we're going to be finishing up a little bit earlier here, but I do want to thank Mike and, and Brian for sharing your unique perspectives and, and the trends that you're seeing across the hundreds of customers that you're talking to, uh, you know, over the last couple of weeks and, and months or so. Um, I'd also like to thank the audience for joining us today. I hope that you found the presentation insightful. Uh, maybe it's starting to kind of pique your interest in some of the conversations that you, you should be having internally or, or maybe want to have with a partner like Hawaiian Telecom or HPE around that. Um, we will be emailing a link uh, to the presentation. So if you want to watch this again later, um, please take a look for, or be on the lookout for that email to come into your inbox. Um, you know, if we if you do have anything again specific that you wanted to ask and, and you know, maybe didn't want to submit it in the Q and A, please feel free to reach out to your account manager or email us at uh, htuniversity at hawaiiantel.com. That's htuniversity at hawaiiantel.com with your question, and we'll have one of our experts get back to you. Uh, I just want to kind of close out by saying, you know, as Jason mentioned, uh, we are committed to Hawaii, and as part of our commitment to uh, Hawaii and to the community, our next virtual Hawaiian Telecom University will be an introduction to telehealth on July 22nd. Uh, we'll have panelists from Queens Health Systems, HMSA, and Hawaii Pacific Health sharing information on how you can begin using this virtual option uh, for doctor visits and some of the benefits to yourself and the community. Uh, if you're interested in attending, please visit hawaiiantel.com slash htu. Again, that's hawaiiantel.com slash htu. And with that, I'll close out and say aloha and take care, everybody. Thank you.